Okay, uh, let me start again. Uh, good afternoon, my name is Günter Horvath. Uh, I'm the deputy uh, chairman of the uh, Vienna International Arbitral Center, and at the same time I have uh, the pleasure of being a partner with uh, Freshfields here in Vienna. I'm heading the dispute resolution group here. Uh, and it is our distinct privilege uh, to have you all still in the room. Uh, we appreciate that. It's, a, it's not something which is given on a Friday afternoon. Uh, and it's always a challenge to be the last panel uh, of a conference of this quality on the second day. So thank you for being here. Uh, the topic of our uh, presentation and discussion this afternoon is dispute resolution. Uh, in energy. And uh, you have heard already uh, a first speaker whom uh, we had invited to this panel, uh, but she had to leave for the plane, and so you have sort of a first show already behind you. Uh, dispute resolution in energy cases is, as you all know, something which uh, is of a particular challenge because it is not something which uh, a lawyer does on his own, it is uh, a, usually a, a fantastic teamwork which stands behind that, uh, in particular involving uh, also experts uh, of different areas, uh, economics, uh, of the gas industry, of the oil industry, of the energy sector. And uh, the uh, team efforts are probably most important to uh, have a successful uh, dispute resolution in those cases. Uh, for the uh, past uh, months, for the past uh, two or three years, however, arbitration uh, had another challenge. It had the question mark uh, put to it, and a uh, very big question mark, because uh, there are uh, strong voices which uh, uh, are aired uh, challenging whether arbitration is still the appropriate means of dispute resolution. And uh, despite of the statistics which you have just seen before, where the number of investment dispute cases per year on the uh, energy chart had sort of jumped up at almost tripled over two or three years, uh, this is not uh, the rule if you look into the newspapers. If you look at the newspapers, you think uh, uh, arbitration as a means of dispute resolution is going to cease, it's going to be disappear in the near future. And uh, that's due to mainly the discussion and the uh, dispute over the TTIP, uh, the uh, uh, envisaged uh, and uh, from some people put it questionable treaty between Europe and uh, the, in America uh, on the free trade. Uh, uh, so we thought this is something which is also uh, having a deep impact on uh, the energy uh, industry. And uh, Karl Pernbacher, uh, who is going to uh, talk about that, will have maybe a more critical uh, uh, approach to it and uh, has uh, the one or other uh, critical remark uh, why private uh, uh, companies uh, might uh, get uh, withdrawn the privilege of uh, finding the right forum uh, while uh, having a dispute with a state. Uh, and uh, that is something which uh, we think uh, is worth to uh, look deeper into. Uh, Karl is a partner with Sagan Lovells uh, in Munich, and uh, he has a particular uh, 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 feature, which is uh, that he has a Polish uh, 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 expertise and, and background. Karl has worked a couple of years in Poland and uh, is frequently involved in cross-border disputes involving Poland uh, as uh, also some other uh, Central Eastern European countries. Uh, Karl, I think uh, you won't take more time because you're also a bit uh, on a schedule running and uh, so why don't you just jump into that topic? Yes. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, you don't need to escape. We will uh, stop in time. Um, I can guarantee you that, therefore, if you stay with us, um, you won't regret it. Um, the title is... Uh, um, I probably I go to the slides because then I can switch them over in time. Is um, TTIP, etc. is arbitration outdated? Okay, okay. 
if you were reading the newspapers, especially Austrian and German newspapers, you get exactly the, the impression that it is outdated. There was a, a, a recent article saying that more than 60% of Germans think that arbitration is negative and should be abolished. Um, this is surprising, and they, they seem to understand that they are not talking about football. Um, this is surprising, but it's not completely negative. There are two positive things in that. If 60% of, of Germans are against arbitration and assuming that, let's say, a third of them knows what they are talking about, this would mean that about 20% know already what arbitration is. And I would never have believed that 20% of people know really what arbitration is and what they are talking about. And this, and this had led, for example, to the fact that my children were reading that in the newspapers and looking at me and uh, cried with a lot of pride and admiration. They were saying, you are doing this thing. And they wouldn't have thought that I'm doing anything which is negative or dangerous or something like that. And I think this made quite an impression. The second thing is that the arbitration community, which is normally a quite self-satisfied um, um, gathering of experts who think they are great and, and, and they know what they do, started to look critical on what they are doing. And while most of the things which are criticized are quite, well, are not that relevant or important, I think uh, there is a lot to say and to improve in arbitration. That's without any doubt. And we start to talk more seriously about what should be improved. Um, now, what is the criticism? It's long and expensive. The second one, which is especially in Germany, it's this private justice, which is exercised by a very small group, mostly of lawyers and American law firms, because America is, is currently quite unpopular. Therefore, if you add the adjective American law firms, it's even worse. Outside of the control in public, it's often said it's in expensive hotels in the back rooms and out of the limelight of the public. And it's a uh, lack of transparency because the arbitrators are not publicly loaned. They even earn money from doing their job. And the last one, it's an undue limitation of the sovereignty of states and governments. Inter interestingly enough, this is always used as an argument by the governments who have no intention of abiding by the contracts their country have concluded in the past. Um, and it's increasingly popular also in Germany. It's always the, the, the usual argument, line of arguments, is always that there is a new government having been voted in um, and therefore you need to respect the, the, the will of the people and you can't respect the contracts which has been concluded previously by the contract. If you read Polish press, you know what I'm talking about. Um, now, before we come to the criticism, what is arbitration for those of you who hopefully had not to do with arbitration so far? Well, first, it's, a, it's a, one of the mechanisms of dispute resolution, like negotiations, like mediation. Um, the important thing is um, you have the end of arbitration is, is a decision like a court decision, and it's as binding as a court decision. In a mediation, you get propositions how to solve the conflicts, but you don't have to. In arbitration, once you have agreed on arbitration, you end up with a an arbitral award, which is more or less a private court decision, which can be enforced all over the world and which countries who respect legal decisions will enforce. Um, arbitration needs just to fulfill some very basic requirements in most of the countries. The first one is that the parties need to be equal in an arbitration. Each side needs to have the same influence in the proceeding. And the other one is that each party needs to be heard. Uh, for on, every, on every point which matters legally or factually. And otherwise, as it's a private proceeding, it can be done and designed as the parties wish to. And therefore, they can do whatever they want. They can have hearings, they can have no hearings, they can have long hearings, they can choose the language, the venue, the arbitrators, the procedural rules, etc. They can do whatever they want, and that's their private proceedings. I mentioned already that due to an international convention, it can be it's globally enforceable, which court decisions are not. That's quite important to remember. You can, of course, enforce court decisions without any problem within the EU. And then, depending on the agreements in, in a couple of, of states, but if you want to enforce German court decisions, for example, in Russia, you will easily find out that it doesn't work. It's just not enforceable. And therefore, they have no value if you need to enforce them. Um, 
we have heard already uh, on the first panelist before the break about investment arbitration. For, you, for those of you who don't know what investment arbitration is, it gives you the possibility as an investor to sue the host country in which you have invested. We heard the example about Vattenfall, Vattenfall being a Swedish company, sued Germany because Germany decided to um, to abandon the nuclear energy. And they considered this as unlawful, and therefore they sued against Germany. A German company would have to sue before state courts, including the Constitutional Court, if you have an uh, investment treaty, uh, or like the energy charter, then you can sue the, uh, the country. What is the advantage of that? The advantage of that is that you don't need to sue the country before its own courts which is sometimes not that successful. It probably works if you are in Vienna, you can go to the Constitutional Court or to the Supreme Court. And if you look at the German example, they even like to condemn their own government from time to time to show them that they're really independent and they're rather more critical than, than other people are. But in a lot of uh, states, you would, you would have doubts whether it's really possible. For example, I'm not sure whether it makes much sense to sue Russia before the Russian Supreme Court and uh, try to get the current government condemned for a multi-billion award. Whereas, as you have probably read, uh, the, the Hordovsky Group got an award before an arbitration uh, tribunal for about, I think, 50 or 60 billion, I don't know, euro or pound, but it doesn't really matter, uh, against the Russian government. Obviously, it's difficult to enforce them, but there was a tribunal which condemned the Russian Federation uh, for damages. And that's the advantage of um, uh, investment arbitration, which gives an investor an uh, independent and neutral forum, which again is not a state-linked forum. Um, the third aspect, I think it needs to be underlined that arbitration, while being a mechanism, it's a very imperfect mechanism. It's very flexible, as I've said to you. It can be designed and, and organized by the parties. But as most things, it's a compromise between a lot of things. Just to give you one or, a few, uh, one or two hints, um, most people think that their own understanding of law is how it should be. They think that's just. But when you compare the American way to a Central European way of conducting, let's say, state court proceedings, you will find that they are completely contrary to each other. And if you talk then to your colleagues, the, our American colleagues think it's appalling that we have no broad discovery before proceedings. They think even that it's completely unjust and our justice is not much worth. Whereas if you ask German companies, most think that Proceedings before American courts are quite difficult to bear and, and, and are unjust for the weaker parties, etc. What I want to say is that arbitration being a compromise between private parties will necessarily be always a compromise between the different concepts of justice, of proceedings, of what the parties expect and of, of what they want. Therefore, you've, and then even if you look at the choice of arbitrator, each party can pick one and they have to agree on a third one if you have three even that choice will be a compromise. Probably the arbitrator appointed by the other side is completely unacceptable. Hopefully he's so accept unacceptable that everybody's aware of that and then he doesn't play any role anymore, but that's not our point. And then the, 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 the third arbitrator might be a compromise between the parties or appointed by somebody. Are they perfect? Are they ideal? No, they are not. But probably they are the only means to get an independent um, body to decide on your case because you don't want you can't impose your own courts in your own country on the other side you don't want to have a dispute before the courts of of your of your partner and therefore you try to find a compromise which is far from being ideal but hopefully better than nothing and that's i think the only point is is arbitration is often the a, a solution which is better than the other alternatives, or is in many cases the only alternative which remains, especially in international um, context. What is important, first, it's a compromise, then the next point is, as it's as flexible as I, as I have described, it, it's, it's necessary, it requires the parties to design the proceedings. What is very dangerous is if parties go into arbitration without knowing about arbitration. 
before courts, you, do, you can be as stupid as you want. The judge will always do what is written in the code, in the Austrian and the German code. He will apply the law, he will run the proceedings. As long as you don't miss the deadlines, you will get the judgment. In arbitration, it's completely different because there's no fixed body of law, of rules, and therefore you need, to, you need to think about how you want to organize your arbitration, how you choose your arbitrators, and how you run the entire proceeding. Therefore, it requires a bit more know-how, and this is due to the flexibi uh, flexibility. The parties need to uh, make choices, and they need to take their responsibility. If they don't do that, they will wake up and will um, wake up probably with negative surprises. Is it um, an efficient process? I think in many instances it's not efficient, especially if you combine it with, with English or American procedural aspects. It sometimes combines the worst elements of all the cultures, of the German and of the American cultures. It's not efficient by, uh, by nature. It can be efficient if the parties organize it in an efficient way, but then they have to do that. It allows you, and I think this is quite important, to combine arbitration with a lot of other alternative dispute resolution techniques, for example, with mediation, with neutral experts, which should be used before arbitration or even sometimes in parallel to arbitration. It's not the same as arbitration, obviously. Um, I've said already it needs to be organized in a, in a way which is, uh, which is uh, adapted to the dispute. If you have gas disputes, you need necessarily to have arbitrators who are aware of the issues and who can organize the proceedings in a way which reflect them and can deal with these issues which you just mentioned, with the commercial issues, with the technical issues, with obviously the legal issue, that's always easy for lawyers, and, and you need, always need to find experts and then you can deal with that. You need to find... Um, the right arbitrators, and then you need to be able to tailor um, make the proceedings. Is it outdated? That's the last question which I wanted to, uh, which I'm supposed to answer. I think it's more necessary than ever, and probably I, I two weeks ago I attended a conference on um, investment arbitration in Warsaw. Probably two years ago, we would have said we don't need investment protection within the EU because every country now guarantees you the necessary rights and the commission will enforce them anyway. The majority of our German clients are quite worried about and they have doubts currently whether their investments, for example, just to give you one current example, in Warsaw, uh, in Poland, are as protected as they should be because they are, for example, worried whether they are, would be able to enforce their rights before the constitutional courts reading in the newspaper. I'm not saying this is right or wrong. I'm just saying you that there seems to be an increasing need of additional protection and, and the, the, our clients are not that convinced that the EU currently will be able in the next 10 years to guarantee the enforcement of their rights all over Europe as long as Europe exists in the current, what is currently unknown, if you're at least um, less likely than it um, seemed to be two years ago. Um, Independence of justice is a concern. It's even a concern in the EU. Obviously, it's a concern outside of the EU. Um, dispute resolution is, is a necessary and effective dispute resolution is necessary not because we want to run our proceedings. I think it's necessary in order to avoid these sort of disputes. Because in a, as a company, only if you're afraid of being sued and then that an award is efficiently um, enforced against you, then you will abide by the contract. As soon as you know that nothing happens because nobody can see you anyway, there's very little in, uh, you're very little incentivized to abide by the contract. I think international organizations like uh, our host here can play a quite an important role in the development of these mechanisms, and, and I hope they will even with uh, increasing um, speed do that. I think the I completely agree with the criticisms of arbitration. I think still that the quality of arbitration and of the arbitrators need to be further uh, improved. But otherwise, I'm afraid that in most of the sectors, it's still the, um, the only uh, mechanism which is uh, available in international um, uh, disputes. And hopefully, it's at least at an acceptable efficiency. Thank you very much. Well, thank you.
Thank you very much, Carl. Uh, just a, a few remarks. Uh, uh, one, I, I uh, definitely still think that uh, in international contracts, not to include an arbitration clause in the contract is a case of malpractice. That's the one remark which I want to make, and it's open for discussion, of course. The second one is that I strongly believe that the discussion on the TTIP, the uh, Transatlantic Trade Investment Partnership, uh, is a reflection of uh, social and society developments which we've seen in uh, Central Europe, in particular Germany and Austria, and nothing else than that. Uh, because to put it very bluntly, uh, if you give up your uh, protection as a party, you give up party autonomy. And this is in particular important for our industry because uh, those who are representatives of, uh, of uh, industry groups here, of uh, companies, of, of distributors, of uh, energy industry groups, know one thing for sure. Their industry is always of major importance to the states because it is providing the population with probably the most important uh, element of their life, energy. And uh, everyone needs it every day. So the argument is, of course, in this industry, brought forth in the first place, because uh, the arguments are, well, uh, the state uh, must not submit itself to the judgment and the criticism and the definite decisions of private persons. There must be judges. But in making this statement, it is inherently uh, uh, seen uh, that that at the same time means that states are not willing to subordinate themselves uh, to an equal treatment uh, with the private party on the other side. And that's the only uh, safeguarding of this principle which is being brought along with uh, arbitration in, in, on a very high level and investor state arbitrations, uh, which has been fought for for a very, very long time. And uh, in reflection of that, uh, I permit me to uh, pass on uh, to our second uh, speaker uh, this afternoon, um, uh, who has lots to say about that privilege of being uh, uh, in a position to carry on a dispute in an independent and impartial uh, uh, way. And uh, he can talk and he will talk about uh, maybe uh, problems which are there if those uh, principles uh, of trade and industry are not guaranteed anymore. Vitaly Rajenko uh, will be talking about the Russia-Ukraine energy disputes. Uh, Vitaly is a partner with CMS in Kiev. He uh, focuses uh, in his practice in particular on uh, oil and gas and mineral resources uh, projects. Uh, interesting enough, I have noted that uh, he was the first Ukrainian member of the Association of International Petroleum Negotiations, the AIPN, and I'm sure uh, he can give us uh, lots of first-hand uh, information on this most critical situation which we are facing there. Vitaly. So, um Here's how the crisis started in a couple of, um, couple of um, major dates. Uh, from the anti-government demonstrations against the previous uh, uh, president of Ukraine and uh, up until uh, annexation of Crimea, uh, uh, shooting down the, uh, the Boeing, uh, Minsk Accords, which are Minsk 1, Minsk 2, which are not even uh, being completely fulfilled right now. So this, the crisis has not gone. Uh, it's pretty much located in the eastern Ukraine, but um, uh, I mean the hostilities are still there. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's it's it has been um, focused there, located there. Uh, otherwise, uh, it's business as usual in U in Ukraine. Uh, but uh, still. Uh, there's obviously the dispute between um, Ukraine and Russian uh, and Russia and Russian and Ukrainian companies. So this is just uh, again a data from from the public sources, the estimations of the uh, of the damages that are sought by Ukraine or or by Russia uh, versus Ukraine. So um, and uh, the three billion that uh, Russian government is still waiting for from the Ukrainian government to pay under the bonds. 
uh, and 32 billion uh, under the supply and transit contracts, uh, mostly supply contract. Um, and vice versa, um, Ukraine, Ukrainian claims to uh, to Russia um, related to the gas uh, Gazprom uh, gas supply and transit, and also annexation, illegal annexation of Crimea. So this is just a, um, a short summary of the of the bond issue. It's not an energy dispute, uh, but again, it raises the question of uh, you know uh, government to government relations and. Uh, also, uh, you know, local legislation that one country may need to put in place or may want to put in place in order not to pay the other one uh, the, the, the outstanding debt, which, which happens uh, quite frequently. Um, currently, uh, also, there are many applications in, uh, in the uh, European Court for Human Rights. Uh, some of those do relate to annexation of Crimea and developments in the eastern Ukraine. Um, and um, also uh, individual implications, not only uh, country to country or company versus country. Um, ICJ, uh, the Ukraine will file a lawsuit against Russia in 2006, ac according to um, according to Ukrainian government's uh, expectations, uh, and that would be like 37 billion in damages. Uh, again, legality of the Crimean annexation will be put in place um, as, as the main question. And uh, one upcoming dispute, we also expect that um, uh, NAFTA gas as a Ukrainian oil and gas ab uh, abundant will also file, should also file the claim um, ag about its uh, Crimean assets uh, that were um, taken by Russia as well uh, during annexation. So, um, also Ukrainian companies are filing uh, losses. So it's it's uh, it's a good time for lawyers, but uh, not not so exciting time for the country, as you as you may imagine. Um, so Ukrainian companies are filing lawsuits against Russia, uh, Oshad Bank, the Ukrainian uh, state savings bank, um, uh, filing a lawsuit uh, in uh, Stockholm, then in Hague. Uh, also, Ukrainian petroleum group uh, controlled by uh, fam infamous oligarch uh, Mr. Kolomoisky has also f uh, has been chasing Russia for the assets that it uh, has uh, nationalized in Crimea. So, uh, pretty much, uh, you know, this year has been the one uh, with the large number of claims and, and lawsuits and uh, large, large money, uh, significant sums of money at stake. But obviously the main for us, and I, I think with the large implications for the country and for Europe and for Gazprom and for, for, he, for uh, his policy, its policy in Europe uh, is the, is the, is the uh, dispute between NAFTA gas and Gazprom. Uh, now I have to make a reservation, I'm not working for either of them, so I can say whatever I want and um, not held liable for that. Um, so I'm a good, in a good spot. Um, it, all, all of this information is taken from the public sources, so the, the, this, these are not my um, observations or, or thoughts, uh, so I, I waive any liability. Uh, but uh, it's interesting to monitor this dispute uh, because, as I said, it has far-reaching implications. And uh, again, a little bit of history. The contracts were uh, put in place uh, in 2009 after uh, the disruption of the Russian gas supply through the territory of Ukraine. And basically, there are two contracts, the supply contract and the transit contract. The supply contract was supposed, uh, basically, it's, it's what Ukraine should have consumed or is consuming, uh, was consuming until recently. Uh, and then uh, transit contract is the gas which passes the territory of Ukraine and then goes into Europe through Slovakia. Um, so the supply was more or less stable and uh, until Ukrainian government had, you know, the money or and uh, probably until the relations were between the countries were uh, sort of uh, more or less okay. Uh, but then uh, once, the, uh, once the war started, once the Crimea has been annexed, obviously uh, the Russia used, uh, Russia used the, 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 political, uh, the political tool and uh, basically all discounts were canceled. So the gas price hiked up to $485 and uh, that was obviously unprecedented and nowhere to be uh, seen in Europe for, for, uh, for, for that time. Uh, Gazprom switched, uh, because 
It was the post-payment, um, usually in the relations between Naftogaz and, and Gazprom, uh, and then a prepayment was introduced, um, and uh, some further relations uh, uh, were somehow adjusted between the parties, um, uh, mostly uh, just to address the, the fact that there was a significant debt between uh, Naft uh, between uh, between Naftogaz and Gazprom. So um, now. This is basically the uh, the history of the price. It was s relatively on par with the European price uh, up until uh, 2014, probably, where where the discounts were were cancelled. And uh, again, you can see that discounts were offered in exchange for some political uh, political deals that were struck uh, between Ukraine and Russia. So. It wasn't really uh, the, the, the market price that was offered to Ukraine. Um, this is how the price moved, uh, uh, the Ukrainian price moved against, uh, against the European price, I mean, uh, mostly Germany. And you can see some sometimes quite significant deviations between them. Uh, again, proving probably the fact that uh, they, they, they were not really uh, um, too much related. Uh, and you can see the, the main events that uh, uh, that were uh, influencing the, the, the movement of the price uh, for Ukraine as well. And so, uh, as far as we know, Gazprom is represented by DLA, Naftogaz is represented by a Norwegian law firm. Um, again, this, the, these are the cases um, uh, and expectations um, uh, uh, about their movement. So, now I think the supply case, the, the supply contract Hearings in the supply in the supply contract case will be uh, postponed, so the verdict uh, or the, the decision of the arbitration tribunal will not be issued in 2016. So we're I think the, the best case scenario would be uh, that it is uh, uh, granted in 2017, and so is the transit contract case. So uh, the main issues of the supply contract dispute is obviously uh, the take or pay clause and uh, price review clause, because uh, uh, Naftogaz is claiming that take or pay clause is not legal, and uh, the price review clause allows uh, the parties to renegotiate uh, and insist on the market-based uh, market price. Uh, so uh, that's what Naftogaz has been, uh, has been claiming. Revise the pricing formula, cancel prohibition of to re-export the gas. <laughs> Uh, and compensate the overpaid amounts uh, due to the fact that the price was not set uh, on the market uh, on the market basis. And Gazprom Exchange says that the uh, take or pay clause should apply, so uh, NAFTA gas should pay for the delivered gas, and also uh, some extra for uh, for certain deliveries in, in, in the previous periods. And also, by the way, for the gas which is consumed in the eastern Ukraine, which is not controlled by Ukraine at the moment. So that, that was a funny, uh, funny argument. Um, so, uh, what, again, what's uh, obvious, and I think everybody knows that, that the Gazprom's uh, formula is based on the oil price. Um, and uh, it, it's not following the market at the moment. You have a, a, a gap between the movement of the oil and the actual movement uh, of the of the gas price under the contract. You obviously, for some reason, it linked not even to the oil itself, but to the oil products, which is kind of uh, interesting. Um, so it has its flaws and uh, its flaws and um, uh, questions that to, to be raised. Uh, but at the same time, the price review mechanism is also not perfect in the in the in the in the uh, supply contract, which uh, uh, which is not making uh, the life of NAFTA gas at the same time easier. So again, um, you can see here uh, the difference in prices for Ukraine and for Europe. And uh, again, from probably 2011, you can see that something went wrong and. Uh, the deviation is is absolutely clear, and uh, you you know one one would one would ask the question you know what, what were the reason, and whether there's really a market-based mechanism for setting up the price for Ukraine. Uh, so um, I wouldn't be going into much detail on the on the, on the further positions of the parties. Um, this is um, 
again, the, the, some of the arguments that Naftogaz is making in, in the process um, uh, also are reiterated or reinforced by the fact that uh, Gazprom, uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure I know about the case where Gazprom would won uh, or have, uh, has won the arbitration in Europe. It is usually either settlement and renegotiation of the price or uh, a complete win by, by the counter counterparty of, uh, of Gazprom. So uh, this just shows the, pictures, uh, the picture of those, of those countries uh, that have renegotiated the contracts with Gazprom. So that shows that uh, you know, uh, the position of the recipient of the Gazprom gas can be, can be uh, strong. And uh, usually, uh, the statistically, uh, Gazprom settles um, uh, in the worst case scenario for them. So uh, again, those are just uh, our observations. Um, what kind of implications or consequences it can have for, for the companies, for Europe, for, for NAFTA gas, for Ukraine. For Ukraine, it's obvious we want to have a, a fair price. Um, we want that uh, Gazprom is dealing with our TSO because our market uh, market uh, has been reformed, uh, and the contract between Gazprom and Nafta Gas, who is now actually an importer of gas and supplier of the gas, just doesn't make sense. So we want that the contract would would uh, would be re-entered with the TSO and on the on the market-based uh, terms. Um, you can see that uh, for Gazprom it means a lot because Ukraine was uh, one of the biggest consumers, and so if the Gazprom loses this dispute, uh, it, 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 would, it would hit them uh, quite quite significantly, and, and they would uh, obviously uh, will need to recognize and deal with Ukraine uh, on the on, on the market terms uh, as as they are doing with the, with the Europe. Uh, for Europe, uh, it's again uh, a case where where Gazprom uh, might might be found to be playing not uh, not fair game, as as uh, was the case in some of the of the mark uh, of the markets in in the uh, European Union, like in Bulgaria, uh, the mar uh, gas supply abuse case in Bulgaria. And uh, also the dominant position uh, case that was raised by the European Commission. So uh, there's a lot to be uh, learned, or I don't know, uh, even uh, a lot will be changed uh, uh, once this dispute is, is, is over. And uh, I think in terms of uh, size and implications uh, for, for all the participants, uh, this might be one of the biggest uh, disputes of the recent decade. Um, about the transit contract, uh, it's 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 also interesting, uh, but again, I don't I don't have time, and I don't want don't want to keep you uh, in the room this uh, this long. Uh, the 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 transit case uh, is is uh, a little bit different. Uh, under transit case, NAFTA gas wants uh, Gazprom to be abiding by the principal ship or pay, and therefore claiming quite significant amount. Um, of, of the funds uh, that Gazprom, uh, um, due to the fact that Gazprom has not transported a certain uh, amount that it has had committed to through Ukraine. So uh, similarly, um, there were disputes that uh, were uh, won uh, in, in, in the similar conditions. Uh, and uh, again, we believe that uh, the position of NAFTA gas uh, is, is quite strong. Um, now, due to the fact that we have this uh, problem with, uh, with the gas from transit, uh, also at the Ukrainian in internal tariffs for gas transportation have, have been changed. So this, this is even having a, an impact on the Ukrainian local system and uh, the entry and exit points for, for Ukrainian system and the tariffs for those points. So uh, again, the uh, implications are over, overreaching. So I uh, don't want to be uh, taking more of your time. I will be happy to answer any of your questions or follow up with, uh, uh, with uh, the conversation after we uh, end this session. Thank you. And uh, I'll let you continue the, the discussion. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Vitaly. Uh, it's now your turn, if you have questions to raise to the two speakers, please go ahead. There's a microphone, 
somebody in? Okay. Please, Mr. Bush. Um, yeah, just a, a brief question to the panel. Um, it seems like in uh, these uh, energy dispute cases, the pace is now set uh, more and more uh, by public enforcers, uh, namely enforcers of competition law, for example, the evaluation of take or pay clauses of uh, price formula, etc., um, is uh, things that are subject to, to uh, pending cases uh, under competition law. Um, I just wanted to, to uh, see your reaction or uh, your feeling about that. How do arbitrators feel about that fact that there? Um, discretion in uh, negotiation or in, in uh, arbitrating on contracts is quite limited uh, uh, by what uh, traditionally is called the order of public and very much so in the energy sector. Well, maybe uh, Carly would like to, to, to cover that. Uh, uh, just a quick response uh, on my side. Uh, I don't think that, uh, that competition law is sort of taking over uh, arbitration. Uh, in fact, uh, as it goes to uh, prices and pricing and price revisions, uh, that's uh, pretty much uh, in, the, in the field of arbitration. Uh, to have a competition law issue uh, in arbitration is uh, in the energy sector, I would call it even a standard feature. And uh, we do work very closely with our competition law experts uh, within Freshels, for instance, uh, and uh, together we sort of go uh, the, the, the design the directions to go in the interest of the client. So this is nothing which is particularly new on on, on our side. It's, it's part of part of uh, of having disputes in in the energy area. It's it's pretty much uh, it might increase a bit. I, I, that could be the case, but. Uh, there was a recent decision by the Austrian Supreme Court on a take or pay case, uh, which was quite widely published also, and uh, that uh, was sort of uh, very clearly uh, confirming that the arbitration's sort of uh, position uh, in energy cases, even in the take or pay area, as being sort of the governing uh, rules under the contractual uh, arrangements amongst the parties. Well, you would like to add something? It's nothing what, which is surprising for arbitration. If, if, you, if you have signed a contract a couple of years ago, I mean, you, you probably described a, a, a dispute which is partly political, allegedly. I don't know. I don't know the, the, the content of the dispute, obviously. I don't know the clauses. Therefore, it's difficult to assess. But otherwise, as a buyer, if you don't want to abide by the contract, I mean, you, you, you argue the price is too high, then you have a, you have a price revision clause, and if it's badly negotiated, the price revision clause might not give you right to revise the price because you have agreed it. Normally, everybody can agree to as disadvantaged contracts as he wishes. And then as a, as a buyer, what can you argue? If you have a contract which doesn't have the clauses you would like them to have from today's perspective, but you concluded it for the next 15 years, you'd say it's void because... And then you need a couple of arguments. And you always say because it's against competition law. In Germany, you would say it's against, uh, against uh, public uh, order public. It's against the, the, the limit. It's unfair, which is probably a difficult argument, uh, even for lawyers. But it's used and gives you 50 pages of, of uh, submission. And then because there everybody writes whatever he wants, then you would say it's against term and conditions because we have, uh, there are standard contracts and these sort of clauses, and then you need arbitrators. And that's my point. You need to select arbitrators who are aware of competition and who can deal with them. They need legally be able to understand competition law, which is not an everyday uh, matter for everybody, and they need to be able to deal with the commercial aspects of competition law because competition law, it's more about competition than about law. It's about understanding markets, about the limitations of markets, and you need, to pe uh, you need people who understand that and, lo and to look through that. But that's in every contract where a part, uh, every long-term supply contract where the buyer doesn't want to pay prices, he will argue that it's against competition law. Therefore, I think 50% of the legal arguments in every arbitration I do currently is about competition law, and there's not much in the award because it's rarely really an issue of competition law, but it's an argument. Hi, my, baby, my name is Beba Miletic, and I have one more question. Uh, again, it's related to competition law and, um, 
an arbitration. For example, what if you have a claim uh, that uh, one party wants to fulfill its obligation, needs to fulfill uh, its obligation under the contract, and is this dispute ongoing before the arbitration? And uh, on the other hand, you have a decision of the National Commission determining that the pricing was uh, against the competition law and that the contracts were null. So how would then the ar uh, arbiters would do? Because you have then arbitration ongoing under the contract which, wa which was by the national authority declared null. So. Well, uh, let me pick that up. Uh, that's something which uh, occurs uh, quite frequently, and it's not, not, not something very exotic. Um, the, uh, the point uh, ultimately probably is that if you have a decision of uh, a competition authority declaring uh, a contractual provision null and void uh, because of a violation of competition laws, then the arbitrators will have a hard time to carry that through. That's the one side of the medal. The other side of the medal is that uh, arbitration uh, tribunals do not have uh, a possibility to uh, bring a case before the European Court of Justice. And uh, so there are now, uh, you see more and more techniques on getting around that issue uh, by involving state courts uh, on, uh, on issues and uh, hoping that uh, in the course of a state court intervention, uh, you get to the uh, European Court of Justice. Uh, how's that? Well, uh, it is a recognized principle that uh, at the same time you have an arbitration clause which exclusively binds the parties to arbitration, you still have a possibility to go to the state court for an interim measure, for a temporary injunction. And uh, in, in doing that, uh, people try to sort of use this procedure and to have that judge, which, uh, who is probably a judge of uh, a very low instance, uh, uh, and has uh, not uh, much um, of a, a deep interest and knowledge of uh, neither competition law, nor arbitration, nor of energy laws, uh, and, and that contract, uh, persuade him to uh, bring that, that case up and, and, and to, 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 to the European Court of Justice. And, um, and that uh, does not work uh, very broadly. Uh, there, there are very, very few uh, instances, but that's a technique which, is, which I see happening now more and more in order to circumvene the, the problem you have uh, brought forth. always have to apply the, the applicable law and if competition law needs to be applied they, they will apply it and if they don't then the, the award can very likely be set aside and therefore I think there's no there's not too much difference between a normal court and, and, uh, and arbitrators they should apply the same law and I think sometimes you have even the, the issue that your arbitrators don't think they think it's in compliance with competition law and then your client will ask can I execute the award because they are afraid that probably public authorities won't share the view and they are still afraid of being fined even though the, the arbitration uh, tribunal thought it's in compliance but then you can, you can declare it enforceable and then the uh, state court will sanction the award and then you can I think you, there's no risk anymore. Um, I had a, a last question, maybe. Um, I realize, because I realize some people have to go. Uh, but one of the, I understand one of the, the proposals in the TTIP is that uh, there will be a, like a sort of permanent court of, arbitra of arbitrators that the Commission and I presume the US authorities will have some role in selecting. And what's the point of that? <laughs> well, uh, uh, actually, it is a compromise uh, proposal by uh, the Commission, um, and uh, uh, it will uh, very clearly lead to uh, a situation which is uh, very unfortunate. Uh, those are not arbitrators, these are judges, they are, they are delegates by the states, uh, and they will inevitably lead to a situation where, again, we are building up enormous uh, costs uh, because uh, there will be uh, uh, one, one judge uh, by 
each of the contracting parties. Uh, he, a judge needs a deputy judge, of course, because he might fall ill. Uh, and uh, never forget, uh, he needs a nice room to work. He needs a secretariat. He needs a driver, probably. Uh, and uh, then it's still the question whether one location is enough. Maybe we need a location in the US and a location in Europe so that the judges can work uh, on both sides of the Atlantic, not in order to um, favor one side of the Atlantic. So uh, what's being achieved by that is uh, taking away uh, private autonomy and at the same time creating a huge amount of cost uh, for the parties to the TTIP. Uh, it's a clear f case of, uh, of, of fault compromising, uh, which uh, it's not in the interest of this industry, which is not in the interest of uh, a party autonomy uh, opposite, opposite states. But I think we are, we are fairly overrunning whatever time you have given to us. And uh, so therefore, I think uh, if there are no more questions, I think we should conclude uh, our panel at that point. We're happy to continue discussing afterwards uh, over a, a maybe glass of wine. Uh, and uh, by that, I hand over to you. <laughs> Well, time is, is pressing, and I think lots of people will be running off now uh, to catch airplanes and uh, make um, the journey back home. So my task uh, is to be as quick and as um, brief as possible, um, and that shouldn't be too hard. Um, all the blame of this event rests on a man you might have seen running around with strange-colored shoelaces. Um, they, they maybe once were dark, but he's run around so hard in organizing this conference and coming up with ideas that the color has drained from the shoelaces. And that is, of course, Dirk. Uh, I believe he's wearing those shoelaces right as we speak. Um, very, uh, very intriguing, those shoelaces. Uh, so it's uh, really um, a tribute to, to Dirk uh, and Rosetta's uh, energy and enthusiasm. Um, in um, getting this conference this year um, organized beyond anything we've done before. It's number four, but we have had uh, yesterday evening uh, with three ministers um, and uh, a surprise speech uh, by uh, Rist Dominique Ristori. We've had the flying dinner. Uh, not many of us maybe have experienced a flying dinner before. I haven't until last night. Um, and of course, we had the workshop yesterday. And indeed, as Janice said, uh, next year you might be here for a week if, uh, <laughs> if we keep going uh, in this way. Now, so this has been uh, a great event, but I have to say it's been a challenge, uh, especially for the people uh, on the ground to organize. And there's one here who I would like to stand up, and she probably doesn't want to, uh, but Anne-Marie deserves a really big round of applause. Thank you as she has had to man the telephones and um, turn away many disappointed participants as we had room for 300 people. And I think that shows you the real value of events like this. We've heard a lot today um, about the hardware, about the software of European law, uh, European energy law as it applies in, in both the EU and in the energy uh, community treaty area. But I think what is really valuable about these events is that this, is, uh, this provides um, an opportunity for both sides, if you like, to confront each other and, and look each other in the eyes and say, is it a good thing that we're doing? Because we can look almost in, like in the mirror to see if it makes sense what we're doing on one side as opposed to the other. And I think that this is the extraordinary value of an event like this, that we're able to ask those questions on the podium, but in the discussions, even during the flying dinner. I think that is a, an opportunity to really think about what we're doing. And when I sit and listen, I must say, I often wonder, what are we doing, really? Where are we going? And I think that that's such a vital exercise for all of us involved uh, in uh, European energy law. There's so many challenges. Uh, there's so much to be done. There's climate change that reminds us that we have to get it done pretty quickly and as efficiently as possible. And it's really vital, I think, that we have this extensive and enthusiastic participation in this event uh, because it makes it really worthwhile, I think, for, for us as organizers. 
uh, and for the rest of the participants that there is such a high level of discussion and debate and participation, such a high level of interest uh, for people coming uh, who want to speak here, who present very professionally and often uh, dare to say quite provocative things, which keeps us all on our toes. So I would really like to thank everybody involved uh, in the organization here in Vienna, but also at the Florence School. I would like to tell you that we have a continuing uh, website, uh, which is energylawforum.eu, which we created uh, for this event. And we will upload all the PowerPoints uh, we will have recordings of the events um, and uh, we will have podcasts to allow you, um, if you've missed things, to follow them or to share them uh, with your colleagues. So this will be an important sort of platform uh, where you can find out more about our activities, including our summer schools, uh, one in Florence, one in Tirana, uh, which the energy community is now running. Uh, uh, more seminars coming up in Florence uh, from our program. So there'll be lots of information on that. And we'd really welcome your feedback. If you have ideas as to what we could do better, um, whether you would like flying breakfasts as well as flying dinners, please don't hesitate to tell us, give us some ideas uh, about topics and how we organize presentations for the future. So with that, um, I'd like to, to thank you all once again, wish you a good trip and a safe trip home, and hope to see you um, at our fifth forum, uh, where we guarantee, I'm right, Dirk, that we'll have a very big uh, conference room. Uh, a palace. A palace, a palace, yes. Uh, so the accommodation will be a little bit more comfortable, uh, but I think Dirk and I, and I and Rosetta have always said there's a great deal of charm to our premises here, uh, which we will miss as well. <laughs> so I hope to see you next year in the palace and um, enjoy your weekend. Thank you.